when you get to a junction, it's not a question of choosing between cake at the left and entering a burning building on the right. It's never cake or death. Just make a decision. Make a decision because it is your only opportunity to course correct, to move forwards, and to learn. And I now tell this to my team, you know, if we're not making decisions, we're not moving forward, we're not course correcting, we're not learning. It's never cake or death. Just make a decision. Because also, if you have to take, you know, three lefts where you could have taken one right, imagine the things that you'll learn along the way. It's never a wasted journey as long as you are always learning and always course correcting. Tess Kosad is the co-founder and CEO of Bayer Fertility, who've raised $1.1 million in an effort to democratize access to safe and affordable fertility treatment. Specifically, they deliver kit to carry out one cycle of intracervical insemination straight to the user's door. She was previously in the public relations world as managing director of Embus Adventures, and we talk about lessons health tech startups can learn from the PR world. We also talk about how she's built Bayer, crucial leadership advice she's received from her mentors, and big opportunities in the fertility market. I hope you enjoy. So I'm always interested in people who come from um, areas outside of healthcare and bring those kinds of algorithms and cross-pollination to the space. If you had to pick a few things that you might have brought from the world of um, advertising and you brought to healthcare, I'd be really interested in hearing those because one I always see in some health tech companies, you know, a lot of like the lifestyle ones like Whoop and Aura, um, I just think they're quite cool. And I think that's clearly not come from the medics and it's clearly not come from the engineers. <laughs> and I think it's probably come from people like you who are like the creatives. So is there anything that comes to mind that you kind of brought from that world? Yeah, there's, there's one thing and one thing alone that comes to mind for me and that is the ability to tell a story. Um, I think when you are the founder of a company, when you are the CEO, your whole job is telling your story and telling your story in a way that gets you employees, that gets you your first hire, that gets you your first check, that gets you a 20 million series A. You know, it, your whole job is telling that story, seeing that story and then telling in a way that just hooks people in. And if there's one thing I bring into my job from the advertising world, it is that. Tesso, on this storytelling stuff, I think this is super fascinating, but how do you take something that's essentially a boring thing and tell a good story around it? Like, are there any things that you, you learned about that or are there any tricks you give to people and how to tell a better story around stuff? Yeah, I think one of the things we sort of specialized in as an ad agency was positioning. So when you can position something in context and help people make sense of the thing that it is, you immediately allow them to connect to it in a much more meaningful way. So we did a lot of work around positioning technologies in the sense of what is the impact that this has on people's lives? You know, what is what is this change? And that can be anything and everything, but you have to know your audience. Who are you talking to? If you don't know who you're talking to and you don't know who you're selling to and you don't know who you're pitching to, how are you going to craft a story that resonates with them? So the first thing I always look for is who's your audience? Do you know them? Do you know what they're looking for? Okay, great. If you know what they're looking for, let's go and craft that story. You know, I think one of the, the products that was potentially one of the least appealing products was offshore oil and gas platform inspection drones. So those were bingo there, but let me break that down. So when you have an oil and gas a rig um, out offshore. So for example, in the North Sea in Scotland, there are a bunch of um, oil and gas rigs that are drilling, producing, and they do inspections of these. So what they usually do is they take a guy and they hook him up and they hang him off the side of an oil rig and they get him to sort of look at the what's called the jacket of this. And really, I think one of the things we did with the, the this drone company was rather than taking a human hanging them off the side of an oil and gas platform in the North Sea in horrible weather and 20 foot waves. You know, we just fly a drone out and do the inspection remotely. Um, you know, and I think there's something in that story. Like, is that a sexy product? Absolutely not. But when you're speaking to people who run oil rigs, the number one, one of the number one things in the, in the oil field is a zero um, tolerance culture to sort of poor safety habits. So they are safety first. So the minute you know that, I know my audience, I know that they're obsessed with safety. I know that there are zero to tolerance policies. I can craft a story around how this is actually, in, you know, leap forward in innovation around 
sort of safety, safety of the operators that are doing the inspection. Now, inspection is critical to making sure that you have a platform that doesn't you know, have any issues, which again, like bleeds into that safety story. So I think the minute you know, you know your audience, you know what they care about, you can create stories that resonate with the things that they care about. And we created beautiful campaigns off the back of that, that were really powerful for our audience. You know, now if you're a banker down in London, do you care? No, like it's not going to be a story that resonates with you, but then don't put that story in the financial times because that's not your audience. Know your audience, know where they're looking, know what they want to hear and craft a story around that. That's super, super interesting. And to tap into more of kind of your oasis of knowledge, um, are there things that you look around when you see your competitors or your friends building stuff in health tech and you just think, wow, you're, you're just doing this completely wrong or that's that's really crap. Like, are there any things, that, any consistent <laughs> mistakes you see people making in terms of PR? <laughs> um, I'm never going to judge and I'm also never going to speak. Yeah, going to try not to trash talk colleagues and, and people in the industry. You know, life is hard enough as is. But I think the one thing I see that's pretty common across a lot of companies and a lot of people is that they they advertise the feature as opposed to advertising the benefit. Um, boy, are people in healthcare, you know, anyone in healthcare is, is really susceptible to that. We talk so much about our innovation, our product, our the, you know, our idea, our, we really, really do. And, and what we forget to do is position that in the context of, well, what is the benefit of that? You know, what are people getting from that? And I find myself doing it. I talk about the Bayer treatment kit as this sort of incredible thing. But actually people really, when they are purchasing a treatment kit from us, they're not buying a piece of hardware. They're buying the chance to start a family. And I think you have to sort of understand what are people really buying from you? I see a lot of companies selling a feature. Tess, I apologize if this next question is a bit offensive, but um, I always <laughs> like asking people who've been in industries like consulting or PR. Um, but, you know, nowadays it's pretty clear what kind of value you're bringing to the world. But back in your PR days, did you feel like you were adding value to the world? Like, is it something that you do and then you go to bed at night being like, cool, I made the world a better place? Or is it something like, it's not really like that. It's just like about no, it's a making question. money and serving clients. Um, I didn't necessarily feel like I was making the world a better place. Um, no, I mean, unequivocally, it does creating better marketing campaigns for wind turbines, making the world a better place, maybe not. But I would make the people working on those things, I would go to bed at night thinking, do you know what? I did a good job on that campaign. I mean, I made their lives easier. Um, you know, I helped that team. I helped that human. So it was a different scale of impact. It was very much sort of making one person's life a little bit easier that day, as opposed to making a positive impact on the world. I've got to say, I prefer being able to make a positive impact on the world. Um, <laughs> so can we dive Can we dive a bit more into the story of Bea? And in particular, sure. I saw this interview you did and you mentioned that, um, I'll just quote, I think David and I met about four times before we began building the company. Uh, to me, that just sounds absolutely crazy. So how did that come about? And then... Uh, <laughs> Just walk me through the story. Yeah, I met David. It was completely random. I went to a networking event with my best friend's husband where I randomly met a lawyer who randomly introduced me to David because she'd seen a Facebook post that he put out into the world where he was looking for a co-founder. Um, and she and I had a great conversation at this event. And she said, oh, I saw this post from David and you should connect. And so we, she connected us. And um at the time, I was sort of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was working on a couple of different things. And David was also still working full time in the clinical world. So neither, neither of us were really full time focused on building something. And we met and we got along really well. And, and yeah, we met. We probably started meeting in real life late December, early January. And then obviously on the 17th of March, the UK went into lockdown. Um, so I incorporated the company on the 30th of March. So Bea is very much a lockdown baby, um, as are as are many of the, the babies that my friends have had. It's similar to Bea, company, different type of baby, but it was very much created in lockdown. So yeah, it is high risk. It was really high risk. And, you know, candidly speaking, David's moved on from Bea and back into the clinical world where he's sort of back patient facing and, and doing what he loves. Um, it's a high risk move. You have to trust, you have to take a leap of faith and you have to know that whatever comes, you'll deal with it then. 
if you try to mitigate for everything before it happens, you'll just get paralyzed. Sometimes you just have to go. And it was hard, you know, it was lonely for the first 14, 16 months. It was just me working full time in the company, um, sort of raising money, try, trying to raise money. You know, that was a whole other saga um, that I think, you know, I'm happy to go into more detail on. But it's it's a lonely and a long journey. And you sometimes you just have to step into it and go. Looking at your past life and looking at even how you found your co-founder earlier on, it seems to be related somewhat to networking and relationship building. Are there things that you've picked up about forming good relationships with people? And, you know, the quote I often see is uh, your, your network is your net worth. So agree, disagree. And what have you learned about forming good relationships? Um, hate to agree, but agree. Um, I learned this the hard way when I started raising money for Bea, our pre-seed round. I opened in July of 2020. Um, it took me eight months and 284 conversations to close that round. And I started that round by listening to Brad Feld's book on Audible three times. And then I sat down in front of my computer and I Googled how to raise money in London. I had no network. I had no contacts. I didn't know anything about it. I'd read a book three times. And, you know, I came into this as a non-technical female founder with no background in the, in the problem space I was addressing. And it was a really hard, it was a hard round. And I think, you know, network would have at least made the jump in a lot easier. So you have 284 conversations. Are there any ways that you got better at uh, pitching what you were doing or making those connections? Like, are there any things you like improved at over that process? For sure. I think you, a couple of things, really, the biggest changes I saw in myself were just in the way that I told the story, in the way that you pitch and the things that you focus on. I think I went into that process probably pretty naive. You know, we all do if you've never raised before. Um, investors are looking for commercial opportunities. So I, I changed the way I spoke about the company and the opportunity that faced us and sort of scaled that up a little bit. I learned to be bolder. Um, I think you have a moment where the rejection is just coming in so thick and fast. And because at the, at the point at which I was raising, it was just me. And so it feels like not only is the company, the product, the idea getting rejected, you are too. So I think you grow really thick skin. Um, you grow up fast, you learn a lot. And, and honestly, when you eventually close that round and you get there and you kind of get over that hurdle, you, you really you really accomplished something. You know, often the first round can be the hardest, especially if you've never raised before. And I think the founders that that do that, I have a huge amount of respect for it. So it's a high bar and it's a tough thing to do. Can you give a bit of context about where you are with Bea at the moment? And then the interesting bit would be um, if everything goes right, where you're kind of heading in the next, say, five years. Great question. Uh, so today we are not quite on the market. Um, so as we have learned, it takes a lot of time to build hardware, especially to build medically regulated hardware. So we're launching in the UK market in July of 2023. In terms of where we're at today, we have a team of 12, um, you know, incredible people. I think the team is the best thing about this company. It really is. Uh, and we're just working on getting our first product to market. It's a full treatment kit uh, that allows people to perform artificial insemination treatment for fertility at home. Uh, that's launching in early 2023. Then we'll look at moving into the US in 2024. So in terms of where we're at, we're just head down, pure focused on getting that over the line. In terms of five years, I think there is so much to play for in the fertility world in this sector of medicine. I, I often liken what we are doing to what happened in the dental industry. So dental care used to happen uniquely in a clinician's office. You, know, you go to the dentist. Today, you can go to the Smile Direct Club and order a kit, you know, Invisalign, Smile Direct Club. You can, you can do what was only possible in a clinician's office in your living room with these beautiful crafted consumer experiences. Now, it happened in the dental industry sort of 10, 15 years ago. It's happening in dermatology now. We can see the race happening in, in the VC world to establish a category leader in clinical grade dermatology care delivered at home. You know, Roe is raising $150 million to create a virtual skincare clinic. It's really happening. The next sector of medicine where this transition, this sort of transformation to home-based care will happen is fertility. 
the reason I'm so confident in that is because all you have to do is look at the the characteristics of the patient pain point versus the physician interest. Dental care, dermatology, fertility, these are not life or death conditions. You know, it's not oncology, it's not cardiology. So the physician interest is relatively low. But I guarantee you, a teenager with acne is really desperate to solve that problem. You know, a family who are trying to get pregnant, they're really desperate to solve that problem. So the patient pain point is really high. These people can't get the care that they need. And so these sectors of medicine are ripe for innovation. They're ripe for startups coming in and taking clinical grade care, taking it out of the clinic and adapting and innovating to deliver that care in the home environment. And so I think if you ask me where Bayer needs to be or where we want to be in five years, we want to lead the home fertility care category. We want to create the category, which we're doing today, and then we want to be out in front leading it. Let's push the boundaries of what's possible in fertility care at home. You know, let's create a, a sort of a journey, let's create an experience that, that empowers people from the day they decide they want a family to the day they have the family that they always wanted, irrespective of who's in the team, who's in the family. You know, it could be me and, you know, a cat and a baby. It could be, you know, it could be families as we sort of traditionally know it to be today. It could be mom, mom and John. You know, it could be you with a known donor. It, it really, we don't, you know, we don't care well, who's in your family. We care that you have the family that you always wanted. And boy, would I love it if they could be the company that empowers people on their family building journeys. Can I push on this concept of um, home fertility treatment? And you're going to see um, that my knowledge of fertility is, you know, strictly uh, dates back to a few weeks of med school and haven't, haven't revisited it since. But if you're trying to help a couple or, you know, whoever get, have a baby, essentially, like that's the kind of end mission, right? From my point of view, it seems like a clinic setup just makes perfect sense that you can come in, see an expert, you can go through all of the different reasons why someone or some couple might not be able to have a baby, uh, which might be quite varied. Um, And it just makes sense that you have this clinic environment and it all happens there. And I don't fully understand why taking that into the home environment, like why is that a good thing in itself? Yeah, there are a couple of things in there that I sort of love to gently push on a little bit, which is why do you need to go into a clinic to see an expert? And why can't you just have a consultation on your phone? And then in terms of, you know, there being multiple causes of infertility. Well, if you look at the data, it's a third, a third, a third, male, female, unexplained. So suddenly you have to go into a clinic, tell an expert your your lifestyle and what's been going on. And you can either do a semen analysis, which rules out a lot of male factor infertility issues, which by the way, you can do at home. Um, you'll do a couple of blood tests on the female side, or it's, it's um, unexplained infertility. But these are all things that can be done at home. And I think the benefit of moving clinical care, care into the home environment as much as is possible, because that, you know, I completely understand that there are many reasons to go into a clinic and many people should be starting their families and going down that path, that clinical pathway. Absolutely. But for those who don't need to be, you know, there is shame, there's stress. We see people in the US who are trying to decide how much of their money they should spend on IVF versus how much of their money they should be putting aside for the baby they don't know if they're going to have via IVF. You know, do I blow all of my savings on treatment to have a baby that I then really can't afford to give much to Do I hold back and not have the baby in the first place? I mean, clinical care is invasive. It's expensive. Um, Why shouldn't we be trying as much as we can to widen up access and affordability to that clinical grade care so that everyone has the chance to access it, not just the few that can go through the doors of a clinic? That's a little bit why I think it's so important to think more broadly about what can be done in the home. What can we take out of the clinical world and make affordable so that people can access care at home. Good point. I like to question underlying assumptions. And one of those is that we need more babies in the world. (laughs) And I just wanted to ask, like, in terms of, you know, your mission, it's clear that you will, of course, be helping people and helping people feel better and and lead fulfilling lives. But if you take that to one side, do we need more babies in the world? Is that something, is that like a good mission to have? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I get this question a lot and it's one of my favorite questions. I, um, I'm not going to speak too strongly on this because I think there are a lot of very strongly held beliefs in this area. Uh, I 
personally am of the opinion that environmentally the most responsible thing people can do is refrain from making babies. But societally, I believe that the most responsible thing that we can do is try to raise more responsible humans who are capable of solving the problems in the world that maybe we aren't capable of solving or that we created <laughs> ourselves. You know? Not fair on them, but I think in terms of the, the where we're at as a society, I think it's perfectly important to think about the impact of you know total fertility rate, um, population replacement rates. There are many, many countries in the world now where they're not replacing their population and the impact that this will have on future generations, it's not going to be fun. You know, economically, it could be pretty catastrophic. So I think societally, and I'm not going to say we have a responsibility to make more babies, but I think the societal impact of babies is net positive, I believe. I wonder if companies like yourselves will have big futures in places with the um, kind of upside down population pyramids. Um, I think, you know, China and Japan come to mind. I don't know. I wonder if, you know, you're talking about UK and US expansion. I wonder if your ultimate calling will be uh, in those places. <laughs> Maybe. So, I mean, the problem that we address is, is affordable and inclusive access to fertility care. A lot of the time, those sort of population pyramid shifts it happen where there are other forces at play. You've got to look a little bit wider than, than merely the problem of accessing clinical care. It starts to become uh, sort of societal issues around women starting their families later. You know, the average age of first-time mothers in the US and the UK is over 30, 31 now. Um, so people are choosing to, to go into the workforce. You know, women are getting educated. They're going to work. They're starting families later. They're having fewer children. So those are not problems that we are best placed to solve. Those are sort of big societal, structural, systemic issues that, um, boy, it'd be great if we could solve them, but for now, we're going to focus on making clinical care accessible and affordable. We'll start there. So on the affordability point, Moore's law is super interesting because it shows that our technology is exponentially increasing. And then the other graph that's interesting is the cost of sequencing the human genome, which shows that things are getting exponentially cheaper as well. So sequencing the human genome, I think it's gone from a few million to under $1,000 now, um, or even $100. I wanted to ask you in... In your world and in the world of fertility, how closely, and I, I know there's multiple different um, technologies, but how closely are we mirroring that human genome sequencing curve and how close how close are we to making things more and more affordable for regular families? Yeah, it's a very good question. In terms of where we're at in the clinical world, there are forces at play beyond just the progression of technology. Actually, it, well, you know, it's a tangent. I'll go into it later. But um, the clinical world, a lot of these sort of big uh, fertility clinic chains are private equity backed. So they're incentivized to be commercial entities. Um, you know, I was speaking to someone in my team yesterday who said that the gross margin on uh, fertility treatments in the clinic is 50 percent. So already we could make clinical care a lot cheaper than it is today. So the average spend on fertility treatment in the UK is 12, I think now it's up at 14,000 pounds per couple. In the US, it's at $61,000. This is a lot of money for people to, to go and create and start a family. I think with the cost of care, the cost of treatment, what's really interesting to me is there's been a ton of investment in innovation in fertility care, in clinical sort of advancements in clinical care and clinical technologies. But we're not really seeing a corresponding uptick in efficacy of um, IVF. So the global sort of success rate of IVF has sort of flattened off in the last 10, 15 years. It's sitting anywhere between 25 and 35%, depending on the, the data set that you look at. So what's curious to me is despite the innovation that we're pumping into improving ART, we're not actually seeing a corresponding uplift in efficacy. So what if we started instead to pour that money into optimizing the technology so that we can start to drive the cost of care down? Well, then you have a bunch of private equity-backed fertility clinics making great margins. The incentives are sort of in an interesting place in this sector of medicine with regards, with regards to affordability and, and making care more affordable. So, you know, not to be too cynical about the whole thing. And I honestly do think that we're going to see 
reductions in the cost of clinical care. You know, we're seeing therapy in the UK come in and start to create incredibly affordable fertility treatments. Kind Body in the US. Similarly, you know, we're going to see market leaders in the clinical world setting price points where they just, like the industry then has to follow. I also think we should start to, to put some money into figuring out how to make care, you know, how to drive a step change in the cost of care as opposed to sort of perpetually just improving what goes on in the lab. I want to talk a little bit about your ideas and different things in this space and in health tech in general. Um, and I basically like asking smart people who are building stuff, you know, if you, if you weren't working on Bayer, what would you be working on? Or, you know, do you see any big opportunities, any big open goals that you're like, ah, that's a, that's, you know, that's a huge opportunity, but I don't have time right now. Are there any things in the health tech space that you think would be, you know, any interesting ideas you have? Yeah. I, th- I mean, in terms of interesting ideas for companies, I don't have any product ideas, but I have areas of medicine that I think are fascinating and moving very quickly and, and really could do with sort of more startups coming in, shining spotlight on them. Again, like I said, first trimester care, um, supporting people through that sort of first pivotal step on, on the family building journey. I think there's a huge opportunity in the fertility world around looking at longitudinal data on an individual basis. So when we look at sort of data sets for fertility around female fertility drops off a cliff at 35, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These numbers are, are based on huge data sets, you know, collected over many, many years. And so you're looking at an average, but fundamentally your fertility is, is really unique to you. So I think that there's a pretty significant opportunity in looking at individual fertility. What are the changes I can make? How can I measure the impact of that change on my fertility? Um, and how do I track that? You know, what kind of data am I collecting? So I think there's something there around understanding individual fertility and the changes that can be made at any point in your life to optimize your fertility. There's got to be something there that really, honestly, really, really excites me. And then you aggregate that data. And that would just be so powerful that uh, for now, focused on Bayer, maybe, maybe we'll get there. But I definitely think there's something around understanding the individual changes and the impact that an individual can make on said individual's fertility and ability to reproduce. Have there been any habits or ways you approach problems or things about you that have helped you get to where you are today? It's a really good question. Um, I think I very much come at something from, I try to be quite thoughtful. Um, It can often make you quite slow to execute. Uh, when you are being too thoughtful. And actually, one of the pieces of advice that I was given that really changed my life, changed how I operate, was uh, the piece of advice that I sum up into cake or death, which is a bit of a a sort of shortened version. But I was sort of lucky enough to have an advisor who lives in New York, and he's built and sold four companies, serial entrepreneur. You know, you don't really find the good ones who have done it four times successfully, but he he's one of them and we're lucky enough to be very, very dear friends. And so we were walking around downtown New York where it's not on the grid. Um, you know, once you get sort of down towards Wall Street area, it's a little bit of a warren down there. And one of my favorite bakeries is down there, but I couldn't quite remember where. So I'm walking around New York with this guy and, and we get to a junction and he's like, left or right? I'm like, well, I don't know. You know where this bakery is, not me. And he's like, left or right? And I'm like, okay, left. We get left and we get to the next street. It's like left or right. I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know where this is. He's like left or right. I'm like, okay, right. The point being, and, and he summed this up so beautifully. He said, when you get to a junction, it's not a question of choosing between cake at the left and entering a burning building on the right. It's never cake or death. Just make a decision. Make a decision because it is your only opportunity to course correct, to move forwards, and to learn. And I now tell this to my team, you know, if we're not making decisions, we're not moving forward, we're not course correcting, and we're not learning. It's never cake or death, just make a decision. Because also, if you have to take, you know, three lefts where you could have taken one right, imagine the things that you'll learn along the way. It's never a wasted journey, as long as you are always learning and always course correcting. And I think that was one of the pieces of advice that I received early on in this journey that that 
changed a lot for me and it took a lot of fear away out of out of the decisions that I had to make because I think also you know founder CEO your job is to make decisions and it can feel so heavy because it feels like you're you're sort of you've got these huge decisions you've got a team that you need to pay and if you get it wrong you suddenly you know you lose your team you're not going to get to market you're not going to raise etc and and that that felt like such a heavy responsibility but taking that away and realizing that actually every decision is not life or death it's an opportunity to learn and to move suddenly made me a lot better at making decisions and that that yeah that was the one piece of advice i think that made the greatest impact on on me as a leader certainly have there been any good books uh, resources, uh, newsletters, anything that you've come across that you find valuable? Yeah, so uh, Brad Feld, Venture Deals. If you're raising, that is the Bible. Um, the Hard Thing About Hard Things um, by Ben Horowitz. I read that probably once a year. My favorite thing about reading that book once a year is that different things resonate with me. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to reflect on where I am in the journey based on what's resonating most in that book. Um, so I think those, those two are really fantastic. There are many, many others. I think first round review puts incredible content into the world. Um, there's a couple of newsletters that I'm on one called wherewithal. That's, that's really great that I really enjoy. And so I think there's, yeah, we, we live in a time we're lucky. There's so much information out there. So many books. I would say my top two are those hard things and, and venture deals. Um, and then, yeah, first round review is a pretty, a pretty good spot too. If there was a skill that you wish you had that you don't as, and that would be really useful as a founder, what would it be? Is there something that comes to mind where you're like, ah, if I, you know, if I, if I'd learned how to do that earlier in my life, or yeah, if I knew, if I knew this area, then that would make my life way easier. Um, sometimes I wish I was a little bolder, but also Actually, then I sort of reflect on that and realize that being a little bit more intentional and thoughtful and slow is one of the things that's allowed Bayer to be what it is today. So I sort of oscillate, uh, you know, as to whether I do or don't wish I was bolder, but definitely wish I'd developed a thicker skin earlier on in the journey. Uh, that would have been that would have been helpful. I hope you enjoyed that episode. You can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, please consider leaving a review. By the way, all of these episodes are now available on Spotify and on YouTube in video format. Thanks for listening.